I, somebody told me that uh, you might have to fill in for time, depending on the next speaker, where he's going to be and what's exactly going on. So I think I have to stay here because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not mic'd. Um, I am mic but not mic'd. Um, <laughs> So, so I think it's my job to fill in the next, hopefully only five minutes, <laughs> but, uh, who I am. I'm Mike Ramsey. I'm on the board of the Patient Safety Foundation. I've been with it since the start. And uh, I think I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, moving the needle, because one of the things that's impressed me today is that um, everybody here is like preaching to the choir. Everybody's on board. Everybody wants to make a change. But how do you get out of here and make the change? And what can we do to move that needle over? And I think our hospitals, there's a Canadian uh, intensivist who drew a cartoon, it's a wonderful slide, that shows the course of a patient in our hospitals. And it shows them getting to the safe place and some of them have problems before they get to the safe place and just occasionally somebody doesn't get to that safe place. That safe place is home. That safe place is home. Our hospitals should be the safest place. So we've got to turn it around, we've got to change it, we've got to make our hospitals the safest place to be when you're sick. No patient in our hospitals should be found dead in bed. Nobody should. Every patient should have a monitor on them. Now, does that sound wild? How many people in this room have a monitor on them right now? How many have got a smart watch on, an Apple, a Fitbit? Yeah. The technology's out there. So why, doesn't, why don't we have our patients with just a little mobile monitor on them that will transmit to the nurse's smartphone? I mean, that, that would be easy. So you could tell the pulse rate's increasing, the pulse rate's slowing, the oxygenation's dropping off, go check on that patient. That we could do today, and that would make a difference. But then we could do it, you've got the monitors on you now, we could do that day case total knee replacement and send the patient home and have uh, them monitored at home. So you could pick up early pneumonia because the heart rate's going up, the saturation's dropping off. So there's some things we could do right away, and I think we need to, because when you think about the people who've been here, talking about their loved ones that have died, the very early patient safety uh, meetings, the summits, we had Lenore Alexander and Pat Lachance, both came up here and they talked about, Lenore talked about her 11-year-old child who died, had a thoracic epidural in place uh, with narcotics, opioids going in, she was asleep in the room with a child. She did not realize that a child was not sleeping, but was in a CO2, carbon dioxide narcosis, and the child died. Pat Lachance, husband, ex-Navy SEAL, had shoulder surgery. If he'd gone home to that safe place, he'd be alive today, but he stayed in the hospital. They gave him some dilaudid, an opioid, and he obstructed respiratory depression, and he died. So what uh, Lenore said was, a monitor would have saved my child's life. It's all that stands between us and a universal post-operative monitoring is the will to use it. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation supported this. CMS, Medicare supported it. The Joint Commission supported it. The summit. App number four was the one we wrote that supports it, and yet very few hospitals have instituted. Dartmouth-Hitchcock Dartmouth have, and shown tremendous savings of lives and transfers to ICU and prevention of codes. We have at Baylor, uh, and again, reduced the rapid response team calls to minimal. But I received an email last month from a nurse in Ohio, and she said, Dr. Ramsey, please forgive me for being so bold. I found your name in a news report on the local news. My husband died following a successful laminectomy. After one hour in surgery, he went to PACU, the recovery room for one hour, and then he was placed on a low-risk medical surgical floor. 
if he had gone home, he'd be alive today. A single level laminectomy, he could have gone home. But they put him on a hydromorphone PCA pump. This pumps uh, an opioid into him when he hits a button. When they came by two hours later, they found him dead. Respiratory depression. So, you know, just as we just heard, you know, when you make a mistake, you learn from it, you never do it again. Here's a mistake we've been making for years. We haven't learned from it, at least very few people have. So that's what I want to impress on everybody here is we've got to make a difference. We've got to go out from here, go back to your hospitals, your institutions, uh, your, your communities, and move that dial. Make a difference. Let's use the technology we have, and we've got more coming. Let's drive these manufacturers of the tech companies to come up with the devices we want and the devices that will talk to each other because in our ICUs we have plenty of monitors and yet still we have unexpected cardiac arrests and that's because the monitors aren't integrated yet, at least most of them aren't, they're not talking to each other and they should be warning us. So we want early warning systems. That technology is out there. In your car, you won't back into a wall because it'll alarm to you. You won't run into somebody now because uh, it, the car will automatically break. So artificial intelligence is where we have to take things. And uh, we can stop these preventable deaths in the hospital. No patient in our hospital should be found dead in bed. Nobody should. Our hospital should be the safest place in the world to be when you're sick. Every patient should have some wireless, non-invasive, small monitor attached to them, just like many of you have today, that transmits to that uh, smartphone, so that the nurses will come and have early warning that you're getting into trouble. The technology exists, we have to go out there and make it happen, and we can do it today, because we've got to learn from these mistakes we're making, we've got to be sure they don't happen again, and we can do. So I'm not sure where we are with time, <laughs> Does anybody know? <laughs> hmm? Five more minutes. Okay, thank you. All right. D does anybody know a good joke? I mean, we could go around and... Uh... Um, I know something else I should mention, and that is because we're in London, we're in Europe, and that is there was a group of European doctors who got together about... Uh, six, seven, maybe even ten years ago, led by a Danish colorectal surgeon, Henrik Kalit, and uh, they decided that surgery should be safer, and surgery should be faster, and patients should do better, and they came up with this enhanced recovery after surgery concept. And the idea was that, uh, you know, for colorectal surgery, patients were staying in hospital for seven, eight days and they were debilitated when they went out, they were on a lot of pain medication, and um, it, it, the morbidity was significant. And so they re-looked at it, retooled it totally, and, and the reason I bring this up is because it's really only now getting to the United States, and that's where I'm living at the moment, and um, we're just instituting it now. You know, 10 years after the National Health Service uh, put it in place here, and uh, I think every hospital in the National Health Service now has enhanced recovery. What that means is by reducing opioids or eliminating them totally, using local anesthetic, regional anesthetic, uh, non-opioid analgesics, uh, patients are recovering faster, uh, doing goal-directed fluid therapy, the right amount of fluids, uh, not too much, not too little, patients recover much faster, they're letting patients eat, or at least letting them drink, up to two hours before surgery. We're trying to do that in the United States, and I tell you, to try and get somebody to drink two hours before surgery, someone will stop it. They won't let that happen because it's so ingrained in the system that you have to be NPO from midnight. Well, uh, we're slowly doing it, and the early adopters we're getting now have two-day admissions for colorectal surgery. Those patients get out of the hospital, they get to that safe place fast, and the morbidity is reduced, and this is going to save lives. So I think this has come out of Europe, and they're leading us and showing us a better way to handle surgery. And 
It doesn't have to be just colorectal. It can be all kinds of uh, surgeries. It results in large reductions in costs, reduction in length of stay, reduced variability in outcome, and patients are doing better with less morbidity and it's saving lives. So uh, it's a new concept, not here, but it's a new concept in the United States and it is making a difference and it's improving patient safety. How am I doing for time now? <laughs> We're about there? <laughs> Three, four minutes, oh wow. Um, okay, there was a man with a three-legged camel. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to let you all relax. I think I better not uh, go on too much longer. Uh, but please, when you leave here, think how, as some of the uh, our, our panelists have said, how can you actually move that needle? Because. You are the choir. We, we're preaching to people who are already, you're here for a reason. You want to make a difference. Uh, and so we, we're not going to convert you into anything. You, you're already converted. How do you go out back to your hospitals, your communities, your institutions, and make that difference? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to leave here and make a difference. And uh, we can do it. Because that's, we've got two years left to get to zero by 2020 two years, and yet once this takes off, and I feel after today's meeting and yesterday, we have taken off. You know, we're making a difference. Now we have to really make it explode so that uh, we, we get to that zero number, and we can do it. You can help us do it. You can make it happen. So thank you all very much indeed.